Welcome, everyone. I'm Shpresa Halimi, Research Assistant Professor with the Institute for Sustainable Solutions. Welcome to our third uh, weekly seminar series with a focus on ecosystem services. I would also like to welcome, the, um, in addition to the students and community partners, our online audience. We are streaming uh, the seminars live and we encourage the online viewers to uh, ask uh, questions at the end. Before I introduce tonight's speakers, speaker, I would like to invite Camille to say a few words about connecting with ISS on social media. Thank you, Shpresa. Uh, so my name is Camille. I am an MBA here at PSU and also a grad research assistant for ISS. Just doing a plug right now for our Facebook page and uh, Twitter page as well. We are using Twitter and Facebook more and more to share news about sustainability at Portland State, um, exciting events, photos, and soon we're going to be sharing job postings as well. So um, they're both really good resources for you to sort of stay close to what is happening uh, in sustainability at PSU. Our Facebook page address is www.facebook.com uh, slash the Institute for Sustainable Solutions, and you can also find that just by searching for sustainability at Portland State or uh, the ISS at Portland State. And our Twitter handle is uh, twitter.com slash issPDXEDU. This is also all available on our uh, webpage, pdx.edu. Um, and just one final plug, uh, we are going to be giving away some rewards and prizes for our new followers. So monthly giveaways include gift certificates to the PSU bookstore and also some um, Chinook books, which are uh, green coupons for companies around Portland. So check us out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Camille. Uh, tonight's speaker is Dr. Sahan Disanayake. Uh, we, who is a visiting professor with the econ economics department here at Portland State University. He is an applied economist working at the intersection of land use, ecosystem services, and conservation using non-market valuation and mathematical programming methods. His research consists of three main areas analyzing public preferences for ecosystem services using choice experiment surveys, studying dynamic aspects of conservation reserve during um, design using site selection model, models and creating spatially explicit land allocation models. Please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Disanayake. Can you hear me? Yeah, OK. Um, so like Spresha said, I'm um, Sahan Desanayaka. I'm a visiting assistant professor at the economics department at Portland State University. And um, this presentation, I thought a lot about exactly how I want to present this. And what I finally ended up was it's going to be a two-part presentation. Um, the first part of the presentation is going to be a general motivation for why we want to study biodiversity ecosystem services. Um, and generally about uh, non-market valuation methods, right? And again, part of this was motivated by the fact that I don't think many of you here are actually economists. Um, then the second part of the survey would actually be, uh, the, of this presentation would be about my survey and the results that I find. Uh, and I'm going to motivate that by motivating why I wanted to uh, look at this specific study, um, the methods that I use, um, my results, and a brief conclusion. So you know, hopefully there's something here for everybody, even if you're not an environmental economist. Um, and you're just you know, looking for the first time at some of the uh, tools that environmental economists use. Um, if, again, if you have clarifying questions, feel free to interrupt me as I go along. But if you have you know, uh, uh, more substantial questions, I think we can wait till the end. Um, and I think that works better with all the recording as well. So to motivate my work, why should we care about ecosystem services and biodiversity? I'm going to give you some facts and figures that come from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, uh, which came out in 2005, and the TEAB report, which was the, the Economics of Ecosystem Services and Biodiversity, which was a, a large intergovernmental uh, report that came out in 2010. 
So increasing uh, conversion of undeveloped habitat to human-dominated landscapes, right, to urban and farming uh, agricultural landscapes. Uh, only about 50% of uh, forest area that existed at the beginning of agri uh, when agriculture was first started remain today. Habitat loss and fragmentation is a primary cause of extinction. Right? So it's not, important, it's not only important to actually think about pres preserving land, conserving land, it's also important to think about the fragmentation issue, which can have a lot of um, implications in terms of species extinction. Humans have, this, this is something that comes from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, hum, humans have increased uh, extinction rates by about a thousand fold over what they would be naturally. And global intact ecosystem systems are disappearing about 1% per year. Right, so here are some facts and figures that sort of try to motivate why it's important for us to focus and study ecosystem services and biodiversity. And you know, do we care about these? Um, and I, I like to think we do. And you know, obviously this whole seminar series is about ecosystem services. So I think most of you who are here at some level uh, would, would also agree with me. Uh, this decade, the UN declared this uh, the decade for biodiversity from 2011 to 2020. Um, so there's also a, a large scale national uh, and international efforts that are going on in terms of protecting ecosystem services and biodiversity. How many of you have heard of uh, IPCC? the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. How many of you have heard of IPBES? Not as many, right? So IPBES is the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which was con convened last year, right? And this is sort of still in the middle of uh, getting put together. But again, it emphasizes that there are global um, efforts that are being undertaken to study these issues of uh, pr uh, preserving biodiversity and uh, produ uh, producing ecosystem services. Now, what can we do in terms of uh, protecting and preserving ecosystem services? Um, ideally, we want to try to preserve natural ecosystem services, uh, ecosystems and biodiversity. Right? But this question becomes interesting to an economist because resources available for conservation are limited. Right? And this becomes a classic economic question. You have these unlimited wants, limited resources. How do you allocate your resources to uh, ensure you have an optimal outcome? Right? So the, the solution to this problem becomes how can you optimally identify the land that you want to preserve or the land that you want to restore? Where do you want to undertake these efforts? And if you think about this question, there are two parts to answering this question. You have ecological and spatial aspects that you need to think about. Species presence is an obvious um, uh, 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 factor that plays into this. You also want to think about size and shape of the areas that you're looking at. And related to that, you have connectivity and clustering issues. Again, going back to the fragmentation issue, you don't want to ha have a collection of scattered sites um, that you think would be a, a, a good ecosystem or a good way of trying to protect biodiversity. It's important to have these connected, contiguous areas. Relocation is in becoming an issue uh, that's gaining in prominence because of climate change. Right? Because of climate change, you have these ecosystems and habitats that are changing and moving. So the land that you protect today is not necessarily where it might be the optimal for a certain species in 50 years' time. So relocation is becoming much more important and crucial as you go through um, with uh, 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 restoration efforts. This problem becomes interesting to an economist because there are economic considerations that you need to take into account. Obviously, cost and budget, right? There are certain costs and budgets involved in doing any sort of conservation activity or uh, providing ecosystem services. You also have to worry about land prices. And part of what you have to worry about land prices is that land prices can change endogenously as a result of activities that are being undertaken by conservation organizations. For example, if you go and buy land, there is a possibility that the surrounding land prices increase. Right? People like to live close to nature. And this is something that's empirically being found. So you have housing prices increase, land prices increase. But as a result of the conservation action, uh, agency's actions, you know, if they come back in, in the future trying to expand, they would have to sort of pay a higher price. So it's important to understand these land price effects. Again, development can be driven by conservation activities. Uh, so again, understanding what um, leads to uh, development and how that interacts with um, uh, efforts to preserve and restore biodiversity and ecosystem services become important. Valuation, right? again, this was mentioned last week, um, you know, trying to put dollar values or trying to identify what values are for these various ecosystems is very important. Because a lot of the times, if you look at policymakers, they make decisions based on dollar values. Right? It could be, I think one of the examples that was mentioned last week was an example about building a road. Right? You get certain economic value out of building a road, 
but there's detrimental values because you're losing ecosystem services. Right? So if you don't have a way to compare, it becomes hard from a policymaker's point of view in, in terms of the counting books, how you're going to make these decisions. So part of what economists are trying to do is come up with valuation techniques that will give you some sort of values. Again, it's important to keep in mind that these are you know, some values of what the ecosystem can give to uh, consumers or give to the public. Related to that, it's important to understand consumer preferences. Again, understanding consumer preference, and the pres my, my actual research presentation today is about consumer preferences. And this is important because at some level, you're asking people to make a choice. Or you're asking people to contribute to conservation efforts, to contribute to pre uh, preserving ecosystem services. And in this sense, understanding what drives, what attributes are important to the general public can help conservation efforts. Right? So understanding uh, preferences can be very important. So my research you know, straddles both of these sides of, of um, economic considerations and ecological and spatial aspects. Part of my work looks at land prices and, and development. So I have some uh, uh, simulate, simulation models that look at land price effects. Um, part of my work is looking at the ecological and spatial aspects. I actually work with the Army Corps of Engineers on a research project, which has been going on for three, four years. Now we have three or four publications, three publications, a couple more that's coming out, where we look at conservation in military lands. And that's a sort of applied problem, and this might be a surprising factor that many of you don't know that military lands or D Department of Defense lands on average has the highest number of endangered and at-risk species compared to any other federal land management agency. So they have, on average, a higher density than the Fish and Wildlife Service lands, the Bureau of Land Management Service lands, the National Park Service lands. And again, part of this is driven by the fact that there's a lot of land that doesn't get used and these military installations are huge. And so there is a lot of biodiversity and ecosystem services in, in these lands. So part of my work has been how can you optimally figure out um, protection for these endangered species in a working landscape, given the fact that there's military training going on, given the fact that there are re relocation considerations that need to be done. Yeah. Actually, it, uh, In terms of the density of endangered species, yes. Um, and I, I have actually a graph somewhere, which it's not on this slide, but, um, and, and there's, there's a, a couple of people who've been working on this uh, problem, uh, Benton, um, and, and they actually look at this, this problem and they find that there's very high uh, values. And finally, part of my work is looking at valuation and consumer preferences. Um, specifically, I'm looking at understanding the willingness to pay to restore an ecosystem. And, and more than just the dollar value of how much people are willing to pay, it's also about understanding what the trade-offs are, what actually drives people to contribute to uh, restoration efforts, what are the attributes that really make a difference in terms of, do, of what the public cares about. And this work that I'm presenting today is joint work with Amy Ando at the, at the University of Illinois. So to sort of you know, step back and look at what economists do with regard to these problems. Economists have various toolkits and various methodology that they use to analyze problems. Um, part of what economists do, do, typically use in terms of their toolkits is um, trying to understand human behavior using analytical models or using uh, theoretical models. And so part of this work is what's the optimal way to allocate resources? or how do we expect people to behave, right? What, what guides um, human behavior uh, if you're thinking of uh, from a, a society point of view? And sometimes part of this work is using numerical uh, uh, simulation methods. Right? Part, part of my work is actually coming up with numerical simulation methods that uh, vary certain parameters and then you try to analyze what happens in, in terms of behavior. Part of what economists do, and a big part of what economists do, is actually to use statistical methods to analyze data. We are living in a world where we are producing more and more data. Right? And analyzing this data can tell you what drives people to behave the way they do. So a big part of what economists uh, is doing is, is studying data using statistical methods. Um, at the same time, when it comes to environmental goods, we have uh, a problem because we have incomplete markets and incomplete in, or imperfect information. Right? A lot of environmental goods are not sold on a market, and a lot of the times you don't have perfect information about anything, but more, more so about environmental um, uh, goods. And in this situation, environmental economists use survey methods. Um, they use survey data to quantify preferences and place values on unmarket um, amenities. 
Right? They could be goods, they could be uh, uh, different non-market things that are not ex exchanged on the market. And in terms of trying to use non-market valuation methods, um, the basic question that economists are trying to answer is, what's the value of an environmental amenity? Right? And if you think about this question of what's the value of an environmental amenity, you have a couple of different ways of looking at this. You have a functional value of an ecosystem, and you have sort of a, a value held by people. Right? So the functional value of an ecosystem could be things like erosion control, carbon sequestration, uh, nutrient recycling, uh, so prevention of soil erosion. Um, these are all functional values of an ecosystem that a lot of ecologists and uh, economists work on trying to identify and characterize. At the same time, you also have the value that's held by people. Right? And these values can be divided up into use values and um, non-use values. The use values, for example, are if you're engaging in recreation. Right? There's a park, you go for a walk. Um, that's sort of a, a use value. Non-use values would be sort of the existence and bequest values. And sort of example would be, you know, if I stood here and said, hey, I just got an email that said the last polar bear just died. I'm pretty sure a lot of you would feel some unhappiness at that, you know, knowing that even though you might never go to the North Pole and, you know, actually see a polar bear or interact with a polar bear, just the fact that they're no longer there can be something that, you know, gives you a certain level of unhappiness. The fact that your grandkids might not be able to actually see them even in a zoo, right? So there's non-use values that you can try to capture. Um, so this is what economists try to do in terms of environmental economics. We try to capture some of these values. At the same time, like I mentioned before, you have a problem because you don't have markets uh, for these goods, so you don't have prices. And because you don't have prices, you need to use non-market valuation techniques. Um, and non-market valuation techniques are aimed at trying to identify, one, a dollar value in terms of how much are people willing to pay, and two, trying to identify uh, what are the different preferences and characteristics that drive people's behavior towards these environmental amenities? So there are two types of non-market valuation methods. Does anybody know what they are? If you've taken a class in environmental economics, this should be something that's very familiar. What are the two main categories of non-market valuation methods? Well, that's an example of one category, contingent valuation, right? So I'm, I'm looking at, you know, you have revealed preference methods, uh, and reveal preference methods are, so this is good because actually I'm, I'm actually having slides that is uh, telling you something you don't know. Um, reveal preference method, me methods are methods that use existing market behavior to get values for goods that are not typically transacted in a market. Um, examples would be hedonic analysis where you use typically um, housing price values, right? So if you have a, a, a lake or a, a conservation area, then you can use, you can look at the housing price values and see how it changes as you're closer to this uh, environmental amenity and away from it for the same type of houses with the same number of rooms and the same square footage and so on. And then you can statistically estimate what the value of that good is, right? So hedonic pricing would be doing that. The travel cost method is something that gets used uh, a lot with uh, sort of large parks, uh, uh, recreation areas where you see how far people are willing to travel and use that information to impute a cost about how much people are willing to pay or how much this, this is worth. But again, to do reveal preference methods, you need to have an existing connection with the market. Right? It doesn't have to be that the good itself is being sold, but you need to have some connection. And this often is not the case with um, uh, uh, some or a lot of non-market value, uh, environmental goods. So you also look at what's called stated preference methods. Right? Stated preference methods are basically survey methods where you are able to describe a hypothetical good or a policy or some scenario and see what people's willingness to pay and preferences are for that. And there are two examples of stated preference methods. Uh, contingent valuation, which was mentioned before, is, is one a survey method. And a, a recent survey method that's been used in the last five, 10 years is uh, choice experiment surveys. And these are both stated preference survey methods. And my work is actually about a choice experiment survey, so I'll talk in more in detail about that. Now, uh, when you use stated preference methods, it's important to keep in mind that you are valuing a hypothetical good in some sense, or a hypothetical scenario, right? So that's a good thing because you don't have to have a connection to a real market. At the same time, that's also a weakness because you have a hypothetical bias that's sort of embedded into the decision making that's going on. And it's always important to keep that in mind as you're going through with these surveys. So before I start on my survey and why I did it, I thought well, it would be nice for me to sh give a few examples of these stated preference surveys because, you know, so again, these are just a couple of examples that I found that I thought would be very interesting. The first one was a study that was done in 2003 by Basma uh, trying to look at the willingness to pay 
to preserve this Ijmir National Forest in the Netherlands. Um, and she finds that the willingness to pay for this national forest is about somewhere between a dollar, a, a, a euro and two euros. Right? Um, so she actually comes up with you know, empirical estimates saying, well, this is how much people would be willing to pay to preserve this. And the, the, uh, the issue in that particular study was that part of this was going to be converted into a, a city. So the, what she was trying to identify was you know, how much is it actually worth to people, assuming you also have sort of an uh, 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 increase in recreation at the same time. So in, they found that there would be about a, a, a euro or two euros uh, in terms of the willingness to pay. Now, these survey methods are not only aimed at identifying dollar values, right? So this is an example of dollar value, but there's a lot more in valuable information that you can extract uh, from these surveys. So here's a survey um, that was done um, about the uh, Everglades in Florida. And the part of the survey was trying to identify what you know, drives people to engage in conservation activities, and part of it was trying to identify how the, how the way you present information changes things. So they actually do a, a, a study where they have two samples. They have a structural characterization and a functional characterization of the ecosystems. Right? So they look to see how these different ways of presenting the ecosystems can influence what people's uh, choices are. So if, if you talk more about the, the functional side of it or you talk more about the structural side, what actually happens, um, they actually get different uh, estimates. And they also find that so socioeconomic and accidental factors can affect the dollar value. Right? But, but insta in, uh, in addition to just calculating a dollar value, they're able to extract information about you know, how to present information. This is an example of a, a, a willingness to pay study that was done to look at what drives um, anglers um, in terms of preferences for restoring salmon habitat and for salmon uh, if, if they're engaged in uh, fishing. And they find that what, what drives the, the uh, preferences are actually the, the stock of the fish, the size of the, the stock of fish, and not necessarily if it's natural or not, right? which sort of makes sense if you're a fisherman, you're interested in trying to make sure you, you know, you're, you're, you're able to catch fish. And the, these, this, the fact whether the fish was actually natural was of, of a lesser issue in, in these studies. So these studies can be used to you know, get information about a wide range of preferences, not just uh, dollar values. The last example is, uh, so I'm from Sri Lanka. So the last example is, is, a, is a, a case study that comes from Sri Lanka about the human elephant conflict. Now in Sri Lanka, this is a big problem. You have, you know, in, in rural areas, you have a lot of farmers that lose crops because of elephants, and as a result, sometimes they would go out and uh, you know, shoot elephants. And elephants actually come into villages, and sometimes they'll, uh, people actually die because of these um, uh, elephants coming in, tearing houses down. So there's a big issue that's been going on that's been studied extensively. And there was a stated preference study that was done to try to identify the willingness to pay. And part of what they did was they compared the urban and rural willingness to pay to protect the Asian elephant. And obviously they found that the urban willingness to pay was much higher because, well, urban people like to see elephants and they, li they, they like to go and see the elephants. Well, the, at the same time, the people who live in these rural villages are not necessarily excited because their crops get stolen or eaten and sometimes their houses get damaged and so on. But the interesting part of this study was um, they did a study to see if you could compensate for the damage. And they find that the urban willingness to pay minus the loss for damages is actually greater than zero. Right, so this says it's possible to come up with a scheme where you can you know, get the urban um, population to cover the loss that's incurred by the rural um, communities, by the farmers. So this is what an economist would say is a, is a Caldo Hicks optimal solution because there is a positive outcome that comes where you know, both the, the, the elephants survive and people are actually getting a positive utility. Right? So these are some examples of how you can use these non-market valuation services. They're not necessarily all about getting dollar values. It's more about trying to understand what the preferences are. Uh, what is the preference? Sorry, uh, that's the willingness to pay. It's, uh, it's how much people would be willing to pay in terms of um, uh, predating a species or you know, restoring an ecosystem. Um, and they find that you know the people in in the cities are willing to pay a larger sum than than uh, the rural uh, community. At the same time, if you look at the, the the values from the urban to the rural, that that is enough to cover the losses that are incurred. Sorry, yeah, please ask if, if there are other uh, acronyms somewhere in there that I haven't explained. Um, so in terms of my specific research study, right, I want I'm trying to use these. Uh, survey techniques, and I have three questions that I'm trying to answer. 
my first question is I want to understand the willingness to pay for environmental goods and how they are influenced by the presence of an alternate environmental good nearby. So the basic idea is if, if you are trying to preserve a certain area, it could be a wetland or a forest or some sort of um, you know, endangered species that's living in a certain area, and you have already people that are, have, ex have ex experienced this ecosystem service or they have an opportunity to go and you know, visit an ecosystem service uh, similar to this, how does that influence your willingness to pay? So if you have, for example, a wetland close by, are you willing to pay more or less than somebody who doesn't have a wetland close by to restore additional wetlands? Right, so that's one of the uh, questions that's running through this. And I'm just curious, how many of you think that if you had a certain ecosystem, it could be a forest, a grassland, or a wetland nearby, and somebody asked you about restoring another one, um, do you think your willingness to pay would be higher than somebody who didn't have one close by or lower? How many think it would be higher? About half of you, okay. Um, how many of you think it would be lower? Okay, so a little less. Um, so that's one of the questions I'm trying to answer, right? So if you think of, about neoclassical economics, economics has this downward sloping demand curve. The basic idea is, well, the first donut you eat gives you a lot of utility. The 30th donut that you eat is gonna make you sick, right? So the more you have of a good, you're willing to pay less. So according to that uh, paradigm, uh, the, 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 according to neoclassical economics, you would actually say that the, the, the marginal willingness to pay for this additional unit would be less. At the same time, there's recently been work that about endogenous preferences. This work shows that your preferences evolve and your preferences change. Right? So if you're exper experiencing a good, if you're able to go and visit a certain ecosystem, then you might be more uh, you might have a higher willingness to pay than somebody who's actually not experienced that ecosystem before. Right? So it's, it's sort of you know, different from the downward sloping demand curve argument. It's, it's looking to say that your preferences can change depending on what you're exposed to. So that's one of the questions I'm trying to answer. Uh, another question that I'm trying to answer is, in terms of measuring biodiversity, what actually do people care about? And this is motivated by the fact that uh, single measures of uh, conservation success. Typically, species richness is used in a lot of studies, in ecological studies, in environmental economic studies, in restoration studies. You try to find the, you know, these biodiversity hotspots that have the most number of species. You try to find the land that maximizes the amount of species that you can preserve in that restored area. But in terms of public preferences, right, not from the ecological point of view, but in terms of public preferences, what actually do people care about? Is it species richness, which is the number of different species that you have, or is it the population density. So if you look outside and you see a lot of black birds that are flying around, does that make you, you know, happy? Is that what you want to see? And you don't necessarily, you might not understand that they're not the same species or that they're not endangered, right? Or the presence of endangered species. Again, you have a lot of work that's been done focused on individual endangered species. You have a lot of conservation efforts that sort of, you know, go uh, based on uh, these charismatic species. So in terms of the public, what matters? Do people care about these endangered species or do people care about some combination of, of these different conservation success goods? So I, I, part of what the research is about is trying to understand what these preferences are. And in terms of maximizing social welfare from restoration efforts, it's important to understand this because a lot of restoration can be done in a way that you can change these attributes, right? So these are not just hypothetical attributes. Um, the example that I look at, which is grasslands, depending on how you maintain grasslands, you can actually cater the grassland to focus more towards endangered species or more towards species richness where you have a lot of species or more towards having you know, a bunch of the same kind of species, but you see a lot. Um, so it's possible to change by, based on your management techniques what the outcome is of a restoration activity. And in that situation, uh, this, is, this work is trying to understand what do people actually care about. Uh, and related to this, another question I'm interested in is trying to see what the trade-off or the substitutability between these different goods are. Again, the idea here is if you have a lot of species, do you care less or more about having some endangered species? Or is it the fact that if you have a lot of endangered species, you care less about everything else? You don't care if you only see one bird as long as you know that you know, that's an endangered bird. Um, you know, so trying to understand what that substitutability is um, is, is, the, is one, one motivation that runs through this work. So basically, again, do uh, goods act as complements or substitutes? And what does that mean in terms of your optimal restoration? Right? Because if, if, if you are looking at a trade-off where they work as substitutes, that means you don't care about what the interactions are between them. You just care about having a lot of something. 
or is it the fact that you care about you know, having these large areas with lots of different species and lots of different individuals and endangered species? I'm trying to understand what those implications are, again, from the public's point of view. So to answer these questions, I focus on grasslands, and I'll explain why I focus on grasslands. Now, uh, this is an example of three different grasslands that you can find um, in, the, uh, in North America. You have uh, sort of short grass prairie, um, mixed grass prairie, and then tall grass prairie. So the study was actually done in Illinois. Um, so most of uh, what the grasslands that exist in Illinois are actually tall grass prairie. So the study was about restoring uh, tall grass prairie. The reason, and so this is an example of what I mean by a grassland. So gr a grassland isn't sort of these little pieces of grass that you see on the highway between the roads. And it's not sort of these grassy areas that you have in the middle of a farm area or sort of urban area. They're actually large tracts of connected land that's able to sustain an ecosystem in its original condition. And the ecological literature says that you would need to have about a, at least a 100 acre grassland to be able to uh, generate the, 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 the original um, uh, conditions that existed. So this is sort of what I mean by grassland. Um, the reason I focus on grasslands is twofold. One, um, there's an increasing loss of grasslands in North America. Right? Um, does anybody know what these are? If you're from the Midwest, you would. What? Farms. Yeah, farms. So they're, exactly, they're pivot irrigated farms. Right? So you have a lot of pivot irrigated farms. This is a, a two pictures from a NASA land cover data. So when you look, this is sort of what you see. You see these pivot irrigated farms where you have a lot of farming that happens and it's pivot irrigated so you see these circles. And you know, two, two, 300 years ago, this would have all been grassland. Right? It's now converted to farming and you have you know, little bits of grassland in the middle of these farming area, but that's not an ecosystem that can you know, nurture the, or the, uh, the biodiversity and the ecosystem services that you would typically find in a grassland. In Illinois, this problem is actually much worse. In Illinois, 99.9% .9 of grasslands have been converted. So it's not 90%, it's not 99%, it's actually 99.9. .9. And these two maps sort of, again, highlight this difference. Um, this is a map of 18, the grasslands in 1820, and this is a map that I made that's similar. It's a map of rural grasslands, so they're not showing you exactly the same thing. Um, but again, as you can see, there are no, I don't know if, how clear this is, but there's a smattering of yellow that's, you know, these little dots that are not connected. So there's been a big conversion of uh, grasslands in Illinois. And the reason um, this is uh, even a bigger problem than just the disappearing ecosystem is because there's a lot of endangered species that are associated with grasslands that are also disappearing as a result of grasslands disappearing. So 17 out of 28 grassland bird species have decreased in the last you know, 30 to 40 years. So if you look at the ecological literature, the general consensus is that, well, to pre prevent this decline in species, we need to restore grasslands. So the best way to try to you know, prevent these uh, 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 problems of uh, this conservation uh, crisis from continuing and becoming larger is to actually start restoring grasslands. And there is a lot of work that's been done to restore large tracts of grassland. Now, at the same time, this work that's been done to restore grassland does not take public preferences or the values of consumers into account. So there's been no non-market valuation studies, no environmental economics have actually studied grasslands as an ecosystem. And if you think about the fact that grasslands are an ecosystem where based on your management techniques, you can actually change the outcome, you can change the number of species that live there, you can change the way it looks, then I think it's very important to get public input or to understand what these preferences are because that can enable uh, 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 optimal solution in terms of maximizing uh, welfare. Right. Partly you're asking for funding, partly in terms of what people care about. And again, just to reiterate the fact that no economic valuation studies have actually looked at grasslands. There's a lot of studies that look at wetlands, a lot of studies that look at forests, individual endangered species. You have dollar values, you have lots of other information about the preferences, but grasslands have sort of been ignored in this literature. So this was another reason to actually look at grasslands. Now, again, to summarize my three research questions, how does the presence of an existing environmental good, in this case grasslands, affect your willingness to pay, right? How much you're willing to pay to restore an additional environmental public good? Um, what's the trade-off or the substitutability between different conservation success measures of biodiversity? You have different ways that you can measure biodiversity. How do the consumers view them with respect to each other? And finally, what are the consumers' preferences and willingness to pay for restoring a grassland as an ecosystem?
Right? Again, the first two questions are very general. They can be applied to any ecosystem, any sort of uh, 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 restoring ecosystem, protecting biodiversity. The last ones focus more on grasslands. Now, in terms of answering these questions, I use a choice experiment survey. Now, like I said before, choice experiment surveys are stated preference methods that can elicit values and preferences for different hypothetical policies, goods, um, or scenarios. And the reason that I focus on a choice experiment survey, right? so again, I said there are two types of stated preference methods, contingent valuation surveys and choice experiment studies. The reason that I focus on a choice experiment survey is because it, it allows us to calculate what's called path worth utilities. Basically, it allows us to figure out what the trade-offs between different attributes in a good are. And that comes from this, the way this methodology is built. So this methodology is built on consumer theory that started uh, with Lancaster. The idea behind consume this, this methodology is that people get utility not from the goods that they consume, but from the attributes of that good. And this is a methodology that actually comes from marketing. It's been used a lot in transportation, and recently it's been used in environmental economics. So the basic idea is if you look at how people buy their pizza, the choices, are, the, the, people that, the choices that people make, it's not about which pizza to buy. It's, it's actually about what is on that pizza. You know, it could be the size of the crust. It could be the toppings. Or if you're thinking about people buying a car, it's, you know, it's, people make choices based on what car they buy, but it's actually driven by you know, the leg room that you have, the size of um, you know, the engine, engine or the, how much power the acceleration the car has. So it's basically the attributes that drive people's choices. So that's sort of what this survey technique is, is built up upon. Right? And the idea is you would describe a service or a good, and you have attributes, and then based on the choices, you can figure out what, how these attributes sort of relate to each other. Um, so again, uh, when you do a choice experiment survey, typically you have a, a set of choice questions. You're asking the respondent to make a choice between uh, a set of goods. So they choose between two or more goods, and the characteristics of each of these bundles that they choose change. Right? So I'm not expecting you to be able to read the, the, the text here, but just to show you typically, so this is one bundle, and this is a second bundle, and you would make a choice saying I choose A or B, and these are characteristics that change. Right? So this is not my survey. This is a survey about uh, understanding preferences for hospital services. It's, it's about you know, the distance to hospitals, the waiting times. So this is also a methodology that gets used by health economists. Uh, but the idea would be something like this, where you have these attributes that are the important attributes, and you have... Um, two bundles or two scenarios, and you would make a choice. And then econometrically, we can sort of figure out what actually drives these choices and how they're related to each other. Um, so when you do a survey like this, actually when you do any type of survey, it's very important to make sure that you cover all the relevant attributes. Right? Because if you don't, what's going to happen is person A is going to assume something different from person B when they're answering the save survey. So it's very important to make sure that all relevant associated attributes with the good that you're looking at has been taken into account. So I've been working on this survey um, for about, I guess, about three years now. Um, and so it's gone through uh, quite a lot of stages. Um, we initially started doing informal focus groups. Just talked to a bunch of people trying to sort of you know, characterize this problem. And once we had that information, we made the, uh, sort of a rough survey, then talked to ecologists and biologists, and then made a bunch of changes based on their input. Then went and talked to actual land managers who actually maintain grasslands. Um, and then we made some changes as a result of this. And then finally, we did formal focus groups. Right? So we did formal focus groups last June, I guess. No. Yeah, sometime in, in spring last year. Um, so we, you know, we were building this for about a year and a half up to that point. And as a result of all this, we have this final list of attributes that we have that we change in, in the survey part. We have species richness, population density, and the presence of endangered species. Again, these are the conservation success measures that I'm interested in measuring. I also have the prevalence of wildflowers. The reason I have the prevalence of wildflowers is because of, um, because of the fact that people care about wildflowers. It's been shown that um, in terms of restoration effects, in terms of you know, parks, nature, that's one of the things that people actually care about a lot. I also have uh, frequency of control burns because that's something that is very important in terms of maintaining grasslands. So the first time I had this, uh, did the survey, I w w didn't have it. And then when I was talking to the ecologists and the land managers, they were like, what do you mean you don't have fire in there? That's a crucial component of maintaining grasslands. And it's also a component that has a detrimental effect because of ash. And uh, you know, so if you're living nearby, it can sort of have an effect on you. 
So you know, we included that. Um, distance to site and cost for sort of obvious reasons, uh, trying to understand how much it would cost and how the distance plays into this. So this is what my uh, survey looks like. Um, as you can see, I have one option or one possibility for a grassland. I have another possibility for a grassland. And then there is this opt out option where you don't want to do any restoration. And then uh, the respondent would make a choice. And so the way the survey is constructed, they actually make seven, they, they see seven different scenarios like this. And each one has different values. So I, I didn't go into this because of time. But when you do a choice experiment survey, one reason it's difficult to do is because you have to come up with these values using experimental design techniques to make sure that you're describing all the whole possible space of all the values. So there's actually some methodology involved in terms of coming up with the, these different values. But the idea is you change the value. So I actually have 59 choice questions and 19 different versions of my survey that got sent out. And they all have different values. Um, and as these values change, you can see how people make a choice. And that gives you information about what's driving their choice. Um, so that's what the, the survey actually looks like. I did a mail survey, partly for funding reasons. Ideally, it would be nice to actually do online survey, or even more ideally, if you had a lot more money, you'd actually want to go and talk to people individually, you know, give, answer all their questions, and then make them do the survey. But mostly due to funding reasons, um, I did a mail survey. I sent out 2,000 uh, surveys. I included uh, incentives, uh, dollar bills in about half of them. Sent out a reminder. I got 316 surveys back, um, and 263 were complete. Right, so because they answer multiple questions in each of these surveys, I have about 1,600 observations uh, with regard to my survey. Now, in terms of analyzing the data, um, these discrete choice models, um, so choice experiment surveys have this sort of a choice data. You're making a choice, right? So when you're making a choice, you use what's called a, a discrete choice model to analyze this data. And typically, people use what's called a multinomial logit model. And so that's what I do. Um, in Addition to that, I do something a little bit more complicated where I do a mixed multinomial logit model. And the difference here is that I'm able to extract information about how the preferences change over people based on their individual characteristics. So I don't just get average values. I actually get values that tell me, based on people's characteristics, you know, what actually changes. And that's something I'm playing around with. But it gives you a lot more information. Um, so methodologically, that's one of the things that I do. And these are the equations that I'm estimating. I'm not going to get into those because of time. But again, if you have questions later on, we can, we can talk about that. Um, so my survey responses were very uh, close um, to this. So this is, this is my data set, and this is uh, what the state averages are. It's a slightly older group. The income is similar. It's slightly more educated. It's slightly more male. But in general, yeah, I was very happy. This was you know, 250 um, surveys that I got back. And in, in general, the response uh, seemed to be fairly similar to the state population. Right? So in terms of my results, now very quickly, um, I find that I do two kinds of an, uh, analyzing of this data. First, I look at what I call main effects, which is trying to see which of these attributes that of the seven attributes that I had was actually important. And I find that everything except for burning is significant. Right? So the important thing here is that all three of these conservation success measures are important. What that means is, as a conservation organization, you know, if, if you're interested, if you're trying to maximize what people care about, if you're trying to take people's perceptions into account, then just focusing on species richness is, is not sufficient. Because you're sort of missing out on, on the picture that uh, people care about all of these other measures as well. In terms of answering my second question, which is trying to understand this subsidizability, again, um, I, I do these trade-off uh, interaction terms. And they're all significant, right? So forget the numbers for now. What they mean, what that means is that um, people look at these conservation success measures as substitutes. So ideally, if you have a very high species richness, you care less about population density or endangered species. If you have a very high species richness, you care less about population density, right? So they sort of act as substitutes as opposed to sort of complements. And um, what this means, this has strong implications for in terms of how you want to manage and characterize your grassland. Because it says in terms of maximizing population, what you want to end up is not with sort of a uniform increase of all these variables, but a more selected solution where you have either a very high number of species or a very high population density, but low numbers of the other two. And so this has implications in terms of how you want to approach uh, conservation um, in, in terms of grasslands. 
finally, in terms of this public good near question, I find that um, if you have a grassland near, people are actually willing to pay more. But if you have a non-grassland nature, nature near, that's not very significant. So what you see is that um, people who ne live near grasslands are willing to pay more to restore another grassland than somebody who doesn't have a grassland near them. Right? So this sort of goes back to this explanation of endogenous preferences. Your preferences evolve as you, as you experience something, and as a result, you're willing to pay more. Now, this has implications for conservation management because it says if you potentially, if you educate consumers, you know, if you take kids to go see, go see parks, then if, if you encourage people to come to ecosystems, see different kinds of um, areas, then your willingness to pay and support for conservation activities will grow. Right? So potentially that's an implication that, that's, that's uh, coming from here. I'm also able to use this data to calculate um, the total willingness to pay for a grassland. Right? And this is, uh, again, a dollar value, even though it's not the most important um, part of this. I can calculate, and again, the results are in a table because um, these values change by distance and by whether you have a grassland near or not. So for a respondent who doesn't have a grassland near, um, if this restoration happens 10 miles away, they'd be willing to pay about $66 per household per year. Um, for somebody um, who has a grass linear, it, would be, it could be as high as 93. So I'm able to actually calculate values, and these can be helpful. Again, it's important to keep in mind that these are just average values that you're seeing right now. Um, you can also see this distance d decay effect. Right? The further away you go, the less you're willing to pay. Um, and you see that gra grasslands, uh, the people who have, uh, respondents who have a grass linear have a higher willingness to pay. To compare this with other ecosystem services, you see that um, it's sort of similar to the range of wetlands, and it's also somewhere similar to the range of uh, CV studies for forests. Again, I put these in red because you have to be very careful about interpreting these large numbers because there, in, in each study that you do, there's a lot of context effects. Right? You're looking at a specific study, but when you do look at a study like this where you're adding up numbers and comparing them and sort of taking them out of the context that they were done, you have to be a little careful about interpreting them. Um, so they would have had different values of recreation. They would have a lot of differences in that sense. But in general, these numbers seem very similar to what, you've, what people have found for a lot of other ecosystem services. Um, I'm going to skip the next few slides. So in, in conclusion, um, I find that species richness, population density, and the presence of endangered species are all significant in terms of public willingness to pay. And so if you care about what the public thinks, then these are all significant. At the same time, I find that these three goods act as substitutes. And what that means is if you want to characterize a grassland that you know, caters best to the public, you get either, either, either something like an endangered species haven or something like a duck factory or a quail factory, right? something that just has lots of very common birds. Um, so again, this is you know, something that um, possibly has strong implications that's coming from this paper. It's also something that I'm still playing around with to see exactly what these implications are. Finally, I find that the willingness to pay for a, a, a grassland here is higher, and that's potentially explained by endogenous preferences. Does anybody have another explanation for why this might be the case? Why people who live close to grasslands have a higher willingness to pay? Yeah. Exactly. Right? So one possible explanation is what economists call locational sorting, where you make your you know, decisions about where you want to live based on the area that you like. Now, you know, one reason I think this might not be very significant is because you know, housing values are fairly high, the willingness to pay here is fairly low, and also the nature near variable was not significant. That would mean that people are making their choices about where to live about being close just to grasslands and not to nature in general. Right? Um, but again, this brings up this point that if you educate and give information about ecosystems, then you are likely to en get more engagement back uh, from, from the public. Um, I can also calculate the total willingness to pay, um, and this provides information that can be used if you're trying to do a sort of a cost-benefit analysis. And finally, I find that these interaction terms that I have are very significant, and that's something that doesn't get done in a lot of um, choice experience study. So that's one of the things that also comes out of, out, out of this paper. Um, so in, in general, um, there's a lot of people I want to thank, but specifically, a uh, part of this study was funded by the Robert Ferber Dissertation Award and the University of Illinois Research Board, so the study actually wouldn't have happened without uh, that information. Um, so yeah, so that's the end of my presentation.
There's some slides I skipped that we can go back to if you have questions, but I'm up for questions. Thank you. I think you have to come to the mic. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that this is a way to calculate people's preferences for different trade-offs. Can you talk a little bit more about the trade-offs? I can see all the different benefits, but if there was like, you know, some kind of jobs trade-off or economic trade-off, how did, how did you incorporate your um, assessments of people's preferences for those trade-offs? No, so that, that's a good question. I, when I said trade-offs, I was actually referring to the trade-offs between the different conservation success measures, trying to see what matters more in terms of biodiversity, uh, in terms of species richness um, and in, along those lines. The reason I didn't look at uh, uh, something like jobs is because there's actually been a lot of studies and typically what you find is that if you, there's a negative correlation. So for example, if you're restoring farmland um, to uh, grassland and if, you, if, if there's a loss of jobs, then people are willing to pay less for that. Uh, whereas if you do this restoration in a way that doesn't affect uh, rural livelihoods, then the willingness to pay tends to be higher. So there's been a lot of work that, that actually have studies this. Um, that the trade-offs I was referring to more, 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 more about these conservation success measures. Yeah, I actually, yeah, for this study, I actually didn't look at it. I did make sure, and this was something that came up. So in the front material for the survey, it says that this restoration is going to be from marginal land. So it's not going to be land that's taken out of farming. It's going to be marginal unused land right now. So we were trying to mitigate this uh, trade-off issue of, of um, jo jobs being lost in that. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, well, first, I'm glad that uh, your example was actually about restoration rather than just, you know, conservation because we don't have that much left that uh, to be just, you know, conserved in its pristine state. So, but we have a concert or actually a restoration issue here in Portland that I'd like to get your thoughts on uh, how you might approach this through you know your survey technique and all and that is that the um, Portland City Council uh, I think it was last April uh, voted uh, to actually require habitat restoration on the north reach of the Whit River uh, this is for the the river plan. The um, city has long had underway this this uh, river plan, and it took several years even to get to the point where they had with just the North Reach part of it. And um, in any case, the industries along the North Reach, like Schnitzer Steel and Gunderson, and you know, big. Um, heavy industry and all, um, went to the Land Use Board of Appeals and actually um, a Court of Appeals and um, uh, decided, you know, it was actually decided in their favor that no, they didn't have to do habitat restoration when they were going to, um, re, you know, um, have a reuse of any of the landscape and all. How would you use your information, you know, your, your approach, I guess, in changing the outcome there? So I'm actually not clear. So the outcome here was that there were companies or institutions that were using the land and the idea was that they would need to restore something equivalent yeah. somewhere else? Yeah, or? yeah. Well, they could either restore it on their own land if they, say, if they were, um, you know, adding um, a building or, or what have you, it would be triggered when they were making a revision um, and all. And then they could either um, restore it on their own land or they could pay to have it uh, restored somewhere else. Um, the, the one example is Toyota uh, at, um, What's that? Uh, gate uh, four. There, um, uh, uh, um, there's a particular term for it, but it, in any case, it's number four. They um, uh, actually restored. I don't know, at least 50 feet. May, it may have been even as much as 150 feet 
of riverfront property they took it out of pavement and put it into native plants trees shrubs and had incredible results in terms of wildlife and all and in fact it even was a real boon for their employees it made it much more interesting to come to work every day and all so you know so we have one really good example already there but you know the other industries are just refusing to to cooperate and part of the idea is to help our endangered salmon you know are certainly a part of it yeah that's 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 a good question I'm not I think part of where this methodology might be useful is to identify what the characteristics of these restoration efforts might be that make it attractive to the firms that do them right I mean is there some way to design these restoration efforts in a way that would make it more attractive to the firms one of the so you know in this particular study I looked at biodiversity indicators I'm actually working with Dave Irving and Rondi who's a master's student here they have a project it's stepping back a little and looking at ecosystem services broadly so instead of these very specific biodiversity indicators that project is looking at you know what matters more is it controlling water temperature having biodiversity is it the carbon sequestration you know so taking a step back and you know obviously costs and management options so you know this sort of survey would be helpful to have the these participant participating firms take the survey and then to see what actually drives is it best is it just a cost initiative what would make them actually you know come out and take part in something like this what you know trying to identify that information you know you could construct a survey uh, along these you know same methodologies that would try to answer that question um, but that that's you know it's it's about incentives trying to understand what intense incentives would you know get people to actually engage or get firms to engage in in in, in that sort of activities um, right wanted to had a kind of a clarification question and it's uh, I'm a restoration practitioner um, I'm looking at um, <clears throat> some of the different attributes that you're trying to kind of um, you know see uh, how much uh, priority there is over other certain ones I'm just wondering how much feedback you uh, got from actual restoration practitioners because uh, a good restoration practitioner can kind of address all the attributes uh, with one sort of plan uh, versus kind of breaking it up and and you know, kind of parceling it up. I guess I was just um, wondering about your choice experiment um, and whether or not that was actually based on feedback from restoration practitioners about um, the different attributes that were going to be tangible, you know, within their overall design. Right. No, so th so we, we, d we did. We talked to uh, grassland uh, restoration ecologists, um, you know, bird ecologists, and actually uh, land managers who actually maintain and manage grasslands. Um, so these attributes came out from that process. Uh, so, for example, the, the example I gave about fire not being there, and you know, it was added on because uh, the restoration ecologist said, "Well, that's something that gets used, uh, and it's not something that you know we can really avoid. It's possible to mow, it's possible to do these other things, but you know, the effect of fire is is different." Um, so we, we did talk uh, a, a lot. Uh, so these attributes sort of came through their their conversations. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, the way the survey presents. Um, you have sort of this independence between these attributes, which won't be the case if you're actually doing the, the actual restoration. But the idea behind this is to identify which of these attributes sort of drive, drive the restoration. But if you're actually doing this restoration on practice, well, yeah, you know, that all these attributes would be linked together at some level. Um, Did you yeah. create any kind of fictitious scenarios in order to you know, see um, kind of the, the emphasize certain attributes over others? Or was it all kind of based on it was it was all achievable goals um, except you know the way these choice experiment surveys are done you actually vary the attribute levels randomly so some of these attribute le levels would be um, uh, unrealistic from a real um, point of view but in terms of the actual restoration that would happen they would be realistic um, so I mean yeah yeah thanks All right, so I had a quick question. Uh, how did uh, 
offsetting, I think it's called, where companies can uh, purchase a land that's uh, like kind of protected or whatever in like an urban area or something like that, and then they can go and uh, get tax credit credits or some kind of incentive to go save forests somewhere else or something like that. Uh, how did your survey take that into account as far as like incentive or is that did that come into play as far as no, conservation? Actually, or anything? It didn't. So this survey was aimed at um, households, right? So the the respondents were actually individual households, you know, people who just you know who, who weren't associated with uh, firms um, or, or companies or organizations. So it was looking at public willingness to pay and public preferences. This other project that that that's going along is actually more along those lines. It's trying to understand what are in terms of you know offsets. What do companies care about in terms of you know getting carbon credits or ecosystem credits in some sense, uh, but but this was focused on households. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, how did you uh, inform your respondents? Uh, was there a section in the survey that defined the different attributes so that they all had the same idea of what they were talking about? Yeah. So the survey again, it was a male survey, so there was limited information. But it had information about what this grassland was, about grasslands in general. And then it also had information about each of the attributes. So it described, like, for example, species richness meant that you'd be able to see lots of different kinds of birds. If, you, if you're talking about population density, it meant that you'd see a lot of um, you know, birds in total, but perhaps not from different kinds. So it, it, there, each of these attributes were explained in the front material, as well as what grassland restoration was, and that this was a 100-acre restoration. There was some uh, access to recreation, and uh, you know the fire can have a negative effect based on these things. So there was uh, a lot of front material uh, in the survey. Yeah, that's a good question. So, in general terms, how does the value held by people compare with the functional value of a particular amenity as determined by ecologists? So I think these are very different values, right? And this is always something that I think you have to be very careful when you do non-market valuation studies because um, you can't expect to get functional values out of you know, people who are not experts. And the way I look at this, the idea isn't to say this val the value that you're getting from people is it's, it's that it subsumes the functional value in some sense. I, the way I look at it, they're, they're very independent values. Um, because for the most part, people will not have an idea about you know, the, that there's a, a biodiversity value or a carbon sequestration value or a you know, nutrient recycling value. Um, I think those are sort of complicated concepts that an expert will understand, but an unexpert won't. So I think these values are very independent. In, in many senses, what you're identifying here is a, a, a use and non-use value combination. Um, it's not about, well, if you have lots of grasslands, it's going to mitigate um, greenhouse gases and prevent, you know, I don't think you're capturing any of these functional values from a survey like this. Um, and, and we were very careful not to, uh, tr you know, try to confuse that issue in some sense. Um, so I think these values that you're getting are purely, you know, if you go back to my slide that had um, those different types of values, um, it's going to go on. So I, I, you know, I think the survey is capturing these mm -hmm. and not the functional values at all. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever studied, if anybody's ever studied this, but as people become more aware of the functional value, does their uh, non-use value also change? So the, well, I don't know about words? the, I, you know, the amount of information that you give is shown to affect um, the outcomes. Uh, okay. And part of that is not just the dollar value, but also the um, the variances that you get in these estimates, they tend to get narrow as you provide more information. Uh, I would assume that if people know more, then their willingness to pay would be higher, yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions? to know I kind of came in here late do you have any like websites or any anything where you will have like this type of information and then also to piggyback on the corporate and company side of, of the equation as far as these 
Well, so, so the, again, lands go. Yeah, so this was focused on um, on uh, individual households, right? Yeah. Uh, and if you want information about this, I'd be there's a pa paper that's still a work in progress, but it, you know, it, it's something that uh, that's actually on my website. So I, if you talk to me afterwards, I can okay. tell you where to find the paper. Cool. Um, in terms of this other uh, ecosystem service um, and sort of firms getting involved, that's this particular project is very much a work in progress right now. But there is a literature uh, about corporate responsibility and sort of how you know these green initiatives impact corporate values. So there, there, there is a fairly large literature on that. It's not an area that I'm uh, uh, familiar with, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions? Well, thank you for coming and for questions.